The uh, title of these notes, Don't It Make My Brown Eyes Blue, is actually a song by a 70s singer named Crystal Gale. And else, you can uh, YouTube or Google or something, uh, Don't It Make My Brown Eyes Blue. But uh, the discussion is, start with, my parents have brown eyes, I have blue. I don't know how many of you that's true for. Um, those of you that have that uh, occasion or have that happening to you, I know what I'm talking about. And my question for you is, how can that be? Because if we are actually a mix of our parents, if you think about the fact that when your parents uh, conceived you, they each gave you some uh, genes, and if you think about the fact that we're considered, and you, as you grow up, somebody will say, well, you look more like your mom, or you look more like your dad, or whatever. But in some cases, you don't at all look like either parent. And we want to talk about today how that can be. And the answer lies in the study of genetics. Genetics. Definition of genetics, the study of genes and their effects on an organism. Study of genes and their effects on an organism. Most of you, I would guess, have already heard of a gene. You have some idea of the concept of a gene, that genes make you what you are. Uh, to talk about genes, we have to start with a man named Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel is considered the founder of modern genetic studies. And the story of Gregor Mendel is actually quite a fascinating one. And so I want to take a little bit of time to talk about that before we get started too far. Here he is. Gregor Mendel grew up in Austria. Austria. He was a monk. Not a scientist, the monk. And better yet, a high school teacher. Gregor, uh, monks back in the day, they he lived in a monastery, and back in the 1800s when Gregor lived, the monastery uh, was closely usually associated with the town. There are other sects, S-E-C-T-S, of monks that maybe live in a monastery far away from anywhere, but this particular group he belonged to uh, was involved in the town that they were nearby. And they would uh, go into the town, and he would walk into town or ride a, something into town and teach in the high school. And he was really, uh, and the other thing the monastery did for the town was help feed it. They had this giant garden and I don't think you need to write this down, but they had this giant garden at the monastery, and he took care of that garden. And it was in taking care of the garden, he started noticing that plants were different from each other. And so while he was working in the garden, he decided to take some time to study pea plants. He was very interested in inheritance. How did they inherit characteristics? And so it was pea plants that he didn't study yet. I want to talk for a little bit about the studies he did. Now, one thing you need to understand about Gregor Mendel is that everything I'm going to tell you now about what he did and what he figured out, he died before anybody knew. He died in the late 1800s, and it wasn't until the early 1900s that as they were cleaning out the monastery, they found some of his work. He had notebooks filled with notes and stuff like that, and they gave it to somebody who might know what they were looking at, and they realized they were looking at the work of a genius. Gregor died knowing things without telling anybody. He just wrote it all down in his book, and then he died, and somebody found his books, and it was after he was dead that he's been credited with all this work. So here's what he did. He noticed that there were actually two colors of pea. Just like beans, by the way, if you have a garden, you might have yellow beans and green beans. There are also yellow peas and green peas. 
You're like, no, I don't think I've ever really seen a yellow pea. You're right. Because people won't buy them in the grocery store. They're not going to buy yellow peas. Peas aren't supposed to be yellow. They're supposed to be green. You probably wouldn't eat pea soup if it was yellow. So, uh, but he had some pea plants that are called true breeding yellow peas. The synonym for that is purebred. That means their parents were yellow, their grandparents were yellow. Okay? And he crossed them with purebred green peas. Now you've probably heard the term crossing. You cross a German shepherd with a Great Dane and you get a Great Shepherd or a German Dane. <laughs> you cross two dogs. You take a purebred dogs and you cross them. You take purebred peas and you cross them. He took some purebred peas and he crossed them. Now, briefly, let's talk about how that's done. This is the flower. The middle of the flower contains the female part called the pistil. On the outside of that are the male parts. that have on their surface pollen. Those are called stamens. Now in order to cross-free flowers, you have to take the pollen from one flower and put it onto the pistil of the other one without the plant pollinating itself. Because plants can pollinate themselves. So he would take a paintbrush and he would get some pollen on it and he would paint it on the pistol of the other flower. Okay, that's crossbreeding. And the question is, what do you think he got? What I want you to do a second is pick the answer you think is the true is the right one. Before I click, before you continue watching this, and I'll click to the next slide, you pick right now as you're watching this, pick the answer you think he got. When he did this, did you think he got all yellow? Did you think half yellow and half green? Did you, do you think green is yellow or do you think all green? Mendel's hypothesis was half yellow, half green, which makes sense. What he really got was all yellow. And that's Gregor when he saw that and he said, exclamation point. Oh, yellow. Oh, yellow. Where'd the green go? Where'd the green go? All he has is yellow. That's super interesting. So... If you would have stopped there, which a lot of people would have, and said, oh, I can't figure it out, the green just went away, he would have been nearly as famous as he is. But he did the next step. He did the next step. He took the all yellow, he took the all yellow offspring, which, by the way, he called the F1 generation for the first generation after the parents, so the yellow cross green purebreds is parent generation. The all yellow is the F1 generation. And he crossed them with each other. So he took all these yellows. And now we would say that those yellows are hybrids, right? They're hybrid. Because you have crossed their yellow and green mixed. They're hybrids. Even though... They don't look any different than the parent yellow. So he takes the two yellows and he crosses them. And what do you think he got this time? Did he get all yellow again? Did he get all green this time? Did he get half green, half yellow this time? Or did he get most yellow, some green? And by the way, this could be flipped. Or most green and some yellow, either one. Pick your answer. Here's what he got. It 
6,022 yellow peas, 2,001 green peas in the second generation. Yes, he counted all of them. And he said exclamation point, and that's a head scratch. Counting 8,000 peas. And he found out that 6,000 of them were yellow and 2,000 of them were green. And he thought that's really interesting. How did that happen? Most of the peas that came out were yellow. A few were green. So he did what any good scientist would do, and he tried it with other traits. And here's where he got a little lucky. He chose seven traits, or six traits that actually work. As we'll see a little later, not all traits work this way. He took round peas and crossed them with wrinkled peas. And in the second generation, he got 5,000, so round and 1850 wrinkle. He did the same thing with the shape of the pod. There are smooth pods and wrinkled pods. He did the same thing with flower color. He did the same cross purple and white. He did the same cross with the color of the pod, green and yellow. He did the same cross with the length of the stem. These would be tall and these would be what are called dwarf. And he got pretty much the same results. About 75% one trait and about 25% the other, or about three quarters one trait and one quarter the other. So here's the hypothesis he made based on those results. He called the yellow color dominant and the green color recessive. His theory was that there are two copies of each gene for each trait. And the term for that, each copy is allele. So there are two alleles of each gene for each trait. Each organism passes on one allele of each gene to its offspring and its gametes, or sex cells. We talked previously about meiosis and how... To make a sex cell to, in a human, you start with 46 chromosomes and you pass on 23. And mom passes on 23 and you put those together to make 46. And each of these chromosomes contains one copy of every gene or an allele. So the offspring gets two total alleles for every gene, two total copies of every gene for every trait. Feel free to pause this if I'm going too fast for you. So, if the yellow true breeding pea had two yellow alleles, and we'll write those as two big Ys, and the green true breeding pea had two green alleles, and we'll write those as two little Ys. You'll see why in a minute. <laughs> da, da. When they cross, their offspring are all big Y, little Y. And you're like, okay, how can that be? Well, this parent only passes on a big Y, and this parent only passes on a little Y. So the genotype, the type of genes of the offspring are big Y and little Y. They have one big Y and one yellow gene and one green gene. One yellow allele and one green allele. the offspring's phenotype would be yellow. Phenotype is physical characteristic. Physical character is yellow. It would look yellow. Even though it has the green allele, it looks yellow. And you can't tell the difference between that yellow and any other yellow. Why would it be yellow? Well, he used the term dominant. That the dominant allele covers up the recessive allele. Big Y, yellow, is the dominant phenotype. And green is recessive. I'm making a little bit of an assumption that you've already heard these words. So, 
when the second generation was crossed. When he took the hybrids yellows, he took the hybrid yellows and he crossed them. Each parent could give either a big Y or a little Y. So, the offspring could then get this, 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 or this. This parent, we could go to this, these two could be passed on, or this one and this one. Or, this one and that one, or that one and that one. If you do the math, that's how it works out. Notice, there are four total possibilities. Big Y, big Y, one, two, big Y, little Y, three, little Y, big Y, and four, little Y, little Y. Three of them will have the dominant phenotype. This one will be yellow, this one will be yellow, and this one will be yellow. And you're like, wait a minute, it has the little Y first. That doesn't matter. If it has the dominant and the recessive allele, the dominant shows up. This is the only one that will be green. So if we go back a few slides to compare that to his actual results, check it out. When he crossed round and wrinkled, his final product was three quarters round, one quarter wrinkled. Same thing here. We write it as a ratio of 3 to 1. 3 to 1. About 3 to 1. About 3 to 1. Usually in science we don't get perfect numbers because of dying of plants and things like that. Oops. Okay. So some terms. A genotype with the same letters, big Y, big Y, or little Y, little Y, is called homozygous. Homo, remember, means the same. So if it has the same letters, capital or lowercase, it's homozygous. If it has different letters, it's heterozygous. Hetero means different or other. So to show results, we would use something called a Punnett square. And we're going to practice with these in class. I'm going to go through this very quickly. A Punnett square is often used to predict the results of genetic crosses. The top and sides are the parents' gametes, and the boxes are the combination that could occur in the offspring. So, in, our, in the case of our Ys, I'm going to replace this with Y. We had a big Y and a little Y from one parent, and the other parent could pass on a big Y or a little Y. Make our little tic-tac-toe board kind of thing here. I always put a little cross here to make sure we know that's what we're crossing. And then we write in, this goes there and that goes down there. This goes over here, this one comes down here. This one goes all the way down, this one goes all the way over, this one goes all the way down, big Y, and this one goes over little Y, and we always write the capitalized first. So in our pun and square here, three yellows, one green. Here's a practice problem you can work on at home. We're going to be working on many more of these plants. A pea plant that is heterozygous for a yellow seed to cross to the green seeded plant. What is the likely fraction of green seeded offspring they will have? Here are the steps to solving pun and square problems. We'll go back over these again in class. If you follow these exactly, you should be able to do pun and square problems 
in your sleep. I'm not going to repeat these out loud. You can figure it out. 